Now's the time when things are shifting. We're gonna, there's gonna be a new world order out there. We got laughs from coast to coast to make you smile. A real life look at each of you to capture all that style. You're the red, white, and blue. The fun that things you do. Why not take the time for a moment to try to see the big picture of what's really going on here? After all, human beings are a biological species. We live in an ecology, in a habitat. And though human ingenuity has mastered an ability to live in basically any place on Earth, cold and hot, we are still organisms and it wouldn't be a bad thing for us to think about the implications thereof. At university, I took a course called Introduction to Ecology. I learned, for example, that certain species of beetles can live among ants undetected in their colonies. And though very different in form and size, the beetles are a lot bigger, these parasitical beetles evolved to have a similar scent as their ant hosts, and so they could move unseen. Ants have a very poor eyesight. The parasitic highwayman beetle, for example, can live among ants and literally steal food from his host's mouths, something we would call a tax. Glands around their heads and mouths secrete a mysterious appeasement compound that distracts the hapless worker ant, researchers explained. To human beings, that could be commercial advertising, for example, something that softens us up to part from our money. And... The ants march on and on and on for the good of the collective, while the highwayman beetle is only out for itself. However, if the fraud is detected, worker ants will attack the beetle, try to flip it over, and then tear off its antennae and legs as punishment, basically a death sentence. Human beings, too, have learned to exploit one another, but several modes of exploitation wholly evade the justice system. The financial exploitation of an entire nation of people through currency inflation, for example, devalues all of our savings. It means we have to work harder and harder for less and less. Commercial advertising that convinces people to purchase goods and services at a price point far exceeding their actual value is another example. And who can resist paying $20 or more at a fancy restaurant for what is basically a $1 pasta dish? Why do we do it? Above all, cities seem to be the epicenter of human exploit. Here, men and women have perfected the art of exploiting people's beliefs, their desires, and their gullibility. The city promises us great tastes, sensations, views, and the fulfillment of our dreams, perhaps access to beautiful women and alcohol. But it all comes at an overpaid price point. Big cities can easily exploit people to the point where they can no longer afford to have families of their own and are therefore forced to embrace the lie of the individualist lifestyle, also heavily promoted by urban propaganda. Families, after all, demand frugal lifestyles and big corporations can't profit off of money that isn't spent. Television, too, and media in general, lure us in with images of beautiful people whose lives are far more exciting than our own, and then TV directors slip in political messaging or even emotional abuse to make us feel inferior unless we buy the next feel-good, better product that we never knew we needed. How much of human energy today is wasted on things that we don't need? But at least we are free, we think. Not if out of the class of urban exploiters, a distinct new race of people has evolved over thousands of years since the beginnings of urban civilization. A people who, like the highwayman beetle, isn't in it for humanity's advancement, but solely for itself. What might the implications of the existence of such a parasitical class of humans be for the rest of us? If, like the ants, we aren't even aware of the presence of such a parasite. Imagine, for the sake of argument, that there is such a race of men 
who look and speak just like us, but whose interests lie with the deliberate exploitation of all of humanity. Say, hypothetically, that this race of men is mostly interested in ruling the world, enslaving everyone, and attempts to do so by, for example, harvesting people's attention, their consciousness, by cleverly exploiting our desires and our unfulfilled lives. Imagine this class of people didn't care about race or religion, nor about culture or tradition, not about the preservation of any conservative ideal, but only saw nature as a business opportunity. In my worst nightmares, such an urban parasite, so driven by global conquest, would learn to attach itself to different peoples, whichever offered the most profits at any given time. If, for example, the Europeans of the colonial age, for a while, appeared to have a chance at ruling the world, then the parasite would inject itself into European societies and their peoples undetected and ride the tiger, so to speak. If at another time the European peoples appear to have exhausted themselves, but other people, say Central Africans and their descendants around the globe, seem to be having a better shot at now winning the world through sheer number and fecundity, then the parasite would happily exchange us for the new host. In fact, a clever parasite betting on all horses at the race to make sure they'd win could even pursue its own strategy of replacing its present host, Europeans, with a new host, Africans, by promoting strategic replacement immigration and by using its media influence to promote one people to positions of power and demote another to poverty, all the while pulling all the strings behind the scenes. Here then lies a window of opportunity. If the urban parasite now appears to prefer other people over ours, perhaps we may finally disconnect from the fruitless rat race that has led to nothing but disappointment in life. Our dreams, needless to say, were never fulfilled. Our wishes were never granted. Only our labor was exploited and our gullibility. Seeing that the city, the big city, is where the parasite derives its power from, as the beetle in an ant colony, may we not freely choose to dissociate ourselves from this parasitical relationship? Might we just walk out? Wouldn't it be possible to create for ourselves a condition upon which no parasite, present or future, could ever exploit our dreams again, by making ourselves ungovernable in some way? Does the answer lie in leaving the big cities? in leaving modernity behind and returning to the lands where we may sustain ourselves without usury and taxation. To truly free ourselves, I believe we have three major tasks ahead of us. One, we must begin to preach the new religion of freedom. Two, we must gradually disconnect people from the ever-abusive mainstream media until we are ready to think for ourselves again. And three, we must prepare for our exodus from urban civilization, quote-unquote, which has proven to be nothing but a flytrap for our desires. This is a strategy for the long term, but if we choose to go down this road now, we shall make ourselves immune to exploitation.